Yesterday's magazine from The Independent on Sunday, on the front cover, it has a beautiful picture of autumn leaves and says, the remarkable true story behind autumn's greatest show of colour. Now, it's actually an article about the Western Burt Arboretum and how it was saved and is not the true story of the coloured leaves of autumn. That's what I'm going to tell you tonight. Why do plants drop their leaves? We'll turn to a current biology book and see what the explanation is there. This says, and almost everybody else says the same kind of thing, that it is um, an adaptation to winter drought. That evergreen trees may have specially small or needle-like leaves that cut down transpiration losses, so drought is not so important. Or that other adaptations to drought include leaves with thick, waxy cuticles. That is the universal view. That's what we were all taught in. We look at the common honeysuckle, then it will drop its leaves in the autumn. And we all know from school, don't we, that the reason the leaves were dropped is to prevent them from being damaged during the frosty nights of winter. But other species, like Caprifolium, Lanicera is in the family of the Caprifoliaceae, so this is, as it were, a species that typifies the family. Uh, this one is listed as an evergreen Lanicera. The leaves are much the same. The plants look very similar. One of them feels compelled to drop its leaves, and the other one doesn't. Another great argument is for competition for nutrient or for water. And here is a Swiss cheese plant, Monstera deliciosa, growing in the middle of tropical rainforest. Very little light, very little nutriment, massive competition, enormous competitive pressures for water and nutriment. And yet the plant grows perfectly contentedly and it sheds leaves as it grows. The older leaves absize and fall to the floor of the forest find exactly the same plant growing at the edge of the rainforest and although the leaves are slightly uh, more uh, lustrous and slightly broader they're not so etiolated because there is more light but they have negligible competition for nutriment far less competition for water no competition at all for light but they still grow in much the same way and they still absize leaves, just as the deep forest plant did. So this notion that leaves are shed because plants are in competition for low levels or decreasing levels of water or for nutriment doesn't hold up. What about that waxy cuticle and the low levels of stomata? Yes, we know from school that things like holly and ivy retain their leaves because the leaves are waxy and so the plants don't need to drop their leaves and we call them evergreens. That isn't true. They do drop their leaves. They shed them spasmodically throughout the spring. If you look underneath a holly tree and you will be up to your ankles in shed holly leaves. They don't all shed them at the same time and in autumn which is why we rightly think of them as evergreen plants. But they do shed their leaves. It isn't true that they do not need to do so. And this is the example that used to get me most worried of all. Here is a young seedling palm. Lots of photosynthetic tissue exposed evenly and well to the sun. It's the way a plant should be designed. And if the plant grows taller, it'll grow more and more leaves, it'll gather more and more sunlight and capture increasing levels of solar energy the bigger it gets. But that's not what happens. If you look at a palm tree and you see that, again, there is this, this overwhelming imperative to drop leaves at any cost, the tree would be far better advised to keep all its leaves. But it doesn't, as it grows, it sheds its leaves all the time. And on occasions, these trees can grow extremely tall. And it was watching trees like this in rainforest in northern Australia some years ago 
that suddenly fitted pieces of a jigsaw together in my inquiring mind. Here is a science news report from 2007. Many of the colours we see in the fall are always present, but they're hidden from view. This remains the current theory. Well, can it really be that these brilliant red colours were there in the leaves all the time? Let me take you down the microscope and we'll look at a section of an Acer leaf in late September. These vertical cells are the palisade cells in the upper layers of the leaf. And I want you to notice that in this section, some of the upper layer of palisade cells have begun to accumulate uh, keratin-like pigments. They are not being revealed when the green of the chlorophyll is removed as winter approaches. Senescence results in the lowering of metabolic rate. But in what I call the metachromatic leaf, the leaf that is changing colour, ladies and gentlemen, the rate of metabolism actually goes up. Ever since I was in school, I was always bothered by one curious fact. We all were raised with an understanding of the essential concomitants of life. Nutrition, irritability, respiration, excretion, reproduction, sensitive, all that kind of stuff. We all remember that from school. And I was always perplexed by the fact that the word excretion was hardly ever mentioned in the textbooks of biology when they dealt with plants. Indeed, if you take a plant physiology textbook from the shelf to this day and look through the index for the word excretion, in almost every book, the word is missing. And it suddenly occurred to me, we need to have an excretory mechanism for plants. This surely must be why it is they're shedding their leaves. The leaf is not merely the laminar organ that we've all been told about. It is not simply the organ by which the plant captures solar energy. Yes, that's its function during the summertime. But in the autumn, I suddenly felt, in the autumn, the leaf has a secondary function that others had missed. The leaf becomes the excretory organ of the plant. Later that year, in October, I published it in Nature and concluded that the yellowed leaf becomes an excretophore. And the shedding of the leaf may be seen as the plant's excretory mechanism. I like the word excretophore. A, a bearer of an excretory product. I mean, one couldn't really say the plant is having a crap in a paper for nature, <laughs> although there is no other way of summing it up in an immediately colloquial and understandable form. So I then published it as a general theory of excretion in higher plants, and the paper set out the fact that plants seem to have this extraordinary mechanism. Just as metabolic wastes are pumped into the leaf, so the heavy metals are actually specifically expelled from the plant and put into the leaf before the leaf is shed. And this gives me an idea. We grow plants which will tolerate the presence of the heavy metals. These plants by transpiration will absorb the heavy, met the heavy metals through simple physics as they grow. And then through the process of excretion I'm positing here tonight, they will pump those heavy metal ions out from the plant's body into the leaves where the leaves are abscised and shed to the ground. And this is the good bit. A month or so later, you go into the woodland and you pick up all the leaves in giant industrial scoops. Those leaves contain a huge amount of the metals that were present in the ground heavy metals. And in my view, you could take the leaves away and you could smelt them and refine the metals from them and not only purify the soil but have a second go at the metals that you had recovered through the phytoremediation by the trees of contaminated soil. Let's do the widest ranging search you could and just put plant, leaf, fall. And we get, just look at that ladies and gentlemen, 26 million sites. I'm terribly happy that ours turn up 
well up at number six out of the 28 million. That is indeed quite gratifying. But, but compare that with the number of sites on plant excretion, 302. Petals and sepals are also shed as plants grow. The sepals are shed after the plant has undergone the metabolically active phase of producing flowers. The petals are shed when the flowers have undergone the metabolically intensive phase of reproducing. And it suddenly occurred to me that we have a general principle here, that a major metabolic episode in vascular plants is always accompanied by the loss, by abscission, of an excretophore, a sepal, a petal, a leaf, a husk, a shell, whatever else it may be. When next you look at a tree in your garden, you see it covered with beautiful, luscious green leaves, and then the leaves turn brown and gold, and a week or two later, in a couple of days, they all fall to the ground. Instead of that romantic, delicious, lilting thought that you might have had in your mind, you'll think, I remember Ford's lecture. The tree has just had its annual crap. And that is indeed what the tree has done. Plants always throw something away every time they do anything energetic. And I believe that we have here a new principle that allows us to look at plants in a new way and to understand the metabolism of plants in a more coherent and united fashion than biology has ever managed to do in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.